Good morning to you all. And God bless each and every one of you. You have a great new addition to your church family with the birth of this new baby, so praise the Lord for that. And uh, praise the Lord for Pastor Tim. My encouragement to you would be to support him, pray for him, encourage him. He's your pastor. It's not an easy job. And uh, you really need to just hold him up in prayer and encourage him day by day, week by week. Uh, so just continue to do that. I'm going to ask uh, my wife, Leslie, to come and read the scripture for this morning. We're going to read from Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. Just a little bit about us. We've been part of Lehigh Valley Grace Brethren Church for over 40 years. Leslie and I have been married for 44 years this past July, and uh, she has a lot of patience with me because uh, marriage is not an easy task. You know, it's, it's a challenge sometimes to be married, especially if you're married to me. And so Leslie has been a faithful woman of God. We have five children, 14 grandchildren, and how many great-grandchildren? Six. Six great-grandchildren. I can't keep count of them all. And none of them live around here except for one child, one of our sons lives around here, but to, so we go to travel to see them from time to time, not as much as we would like. So uh, just pay attention to God's word this morning as Leslie reads from Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to be with you all, and the singing was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. It sounded like this whole place was full, so praise God. I will be reading from Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. Hear the word of the Lord. They came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes, and he got out of the boat immediately, and a man from the tombs, which was an unclean spirit, met him, and he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him any more even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gnashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, What is your name? And he said to him, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly, not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain, and the demons implored him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been de demon-possessed, sitting down, clothed in his right mind, the very man who had the legion, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it uh, described to them how it had happened, to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to implore him to leave the region. At, um, as he was getting into the boat, the man had been demon-possessed, was imploring him that he might accompany him. But he did not let him. He said to him, go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has made you well and had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. Hear the word of the Lord. Amen. 
Thank you, Leslie, for reading that for us. Um, a few weeks ago, I, I get up early in the mornings before I go to work, and I like to study and read scripture. And you know, when you're reading scripture, sometimes something just catches your attention more than other times. And this was one of those passages that when I was reading and studying early in the morning that caught my attention. And I was thinking to myself, man, I'd love to preach a sermon on this one day. And then about a few, you know, last week, I think it was, Pastor Larry called me. He says, hey, you want to go over to Pure Word Church? And I said, sure. I know exactly what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk from Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. And I'm not, I'm not an extemporaneous speaker, so I write things down. I write notes out. So uh, I'll read from my notes. I'll read from what I've written down. But hopefully God will bless you this morning as we look into his word and see what he has for us. So in Mark chapter 5, we know that Mark is the second of the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark is the shortest and the most concise of all the Gospels. And a lot of people, a lot of scholars identify Mark as the John Mark from the book of Acts. If you've read through the book of Acts, you've known, you've heard the name John Mark or Mark. He was a relative of Barnabas. And he, Barnabas, and Paul, and John Mark went together on the first missionary journey when you read through the book of Acts. This same Mark, who wrote this gospel, may have also served as what's called an amanuensis for Peter. Amanuensis is a big word that just means secretary or scribe. And so it's thought by a lot of scholars that as Peter, the apostle, was writing down his memoirs, or was re recounting his memoirs, that Mark is actually the one who wrote them down. And so the gospel we're reading is really the memoirs of Peter. A lot of scholars feel that that's true about Mark. But as we look at this chap passage in chapter 5 that Leslie read for us this morning, this is an incredible true story that happened in Jesus' ministry. We, but let's look at the context. Just before Jesus encounters this demoniac at the end of chapter 4, if you look to chapter 4, you see Jesus has had a very busy day. In Mark 4, he's on the shore in, in, on Lake Galilee, and he's teaching a very large crowd, so large that he, he gets into a boat and he pushes off the shore a little bit so he's not too crowded. He spends a lot of time teaching that day, and you think that at the end of the day, He'd want to just go home and get some nice dinner and relax and get a good night's sleep. But no, his work is not over. He tells his disciples to get into the boat and to row across the other side of the lake. He has something else he needs to do. Well, on the way during the night, they're rowing across the Sea of Galilee. In Mark 4, verses 38 to 41, we read that this great storm arose on the lake and in fact, the weather got so severe that the boat was in danger of sinking. Where was Jesus? We read in, in uh, these verses that he was in the stern of the boat, the back of the boat, asleep on a cushion. Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? The disciples wake him up. And so Jesus wakes up and with three words, he calms a storm. He says, peace, be still. And immediately the storm stills, the waves calm down, the sea is clear. Jesus has done a miracle. He's done the miraculous. The disciples' response at the end of Mark 4 says, They were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus shows us that he's master over even nature and the chaos that nature throws our way. He, with three words, he could still the storm. So then moving into chapter five, what Leslie read this morning, verse one, we read that they came to the other side. So this is the second time that we've heard this expression, other side being used. And Jesus has deliberately moved into this country, the area of the Gerasenes. And it was an area that was mostly Gentile meaning non-Jewish. If you're not Jewish, you're Gentile. And so he goes into this Gentile area, and it was a very harsh environment filled with lots of deserts, harsh terrain, steep cliffs, and it was also known as the Decapolis. 
That was an area of 10 cities, Decapolis. And these 10 cities were built and they were maintained by the Roman army who was occupying that area at that time. So this emphasis that Jesus is using on the other side shows us that he's really entering into almost enemy territory. He's leaving his Jewish culture and he's going into a very Gentile, pagan, unhospitable culture. Very little in common between the Jewish people and these Gentiles who are in this area. Probably this demoniac had been watching Jesus from a steep cliff that were so prevalent in that area. And maybe he was even watching the storm at night as it was all suddenly ceased and, and became calm. We read in verse 6 that he's watching from afar and he sees Jesus approaching. And as soon as verse 2, as soon as Jesus gets out of the boat, it says that immediately there met him there a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit. Jesus no sooner got his foot on the shore than the demoniac was there. You think Jesus would have chosen better company. I mean, he could have providentially arranged to meet some governor or a rich man or some philosopher or well-known person in the area. But no, Jesus came to meet this man who was demon-possessed. In Mark chapter 2, a few verses back, verses 16 and 17, Mark chapter 2, we read the scribes and the Pharisees. It says, when they saw that he, Jesus, was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with sinners and tax collectors? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus has come to this area, to this region, to meet someone who has not come to this area to meet someone who thinks they're righteous with no need of God's saving power. He's come all this way across the sea to meet this Gentile man, a man who is probably the lowest of the lowest. He's been rejected. He's been marginalized by society. He's despised by everyone. He has an unclean spirit. It almost seems like there's no hope left for him. So I want to spend a few moments looking at the condition of this man who is demon-possessed. Read with me in verses 3 through 5 of Mark chapter 5. First of all, in verse 3, we read that he lived among the tombs. His home was a graveyard. His home was filled with all the sights and smells of death. All his neighbors were corpses in various states of decay. He called out, no one answered but the demons. In verse 3, we read that no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. I think his family tried to help him as best they could. Others may have tried to intervene and help, but his condition only seemed to get worse and worse. In verse 4, we read that he had often been bound with shackles and chains. He was a constant source of trouble for his family, for his friends. In and out of jail, in and out of rehab. They tried all the best medicine, all the psychiatrists, nothing helped. And then verse 4, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles into pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. It's becoming more and more evident as time goes on that this problem is beyond the natural. It's beyond the physical. There is a supernatural force at work here in this man's life. He's being controlled by a force more powerful, a being more powerful than anything that they were capable of dealing with. And then finally in verse 5 we read, Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. He was a cutter. He despised himself, but was unable to end his misery. In complete torment, shouting and crying out, never a timeout, never a break. What a sad state this man is in. Do you begin to 
to get the glimpse of the hopelessness of a situation, doesn't seem like there's much that can be done for him. Many today say that there's nothing real beyond what we can see or hear or touch or smell. Many would deny that there is no truth or reality beyond what science or medicine or economy or economics can prove. But the Bible clearly shows us that there is an unseen realm where there is a cosmic battle raging. There are rulers, there are authorities, there are spiritual forces of evil. It's real and it's raging all around us in this unseen realm. We're told in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic forces over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You might get a little fearful when you hear these things, but hold on. Jesus has landed on the shore. He's come over during the night. And he's there to help. Also, I don't want you to think that this poor wretch of a man is innocent of his dilemma. In Luke 11, verses 24 through 26, we read this about unclean spirits. Jesus says that when an unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept, clean, and in good order. Then it goes and brings seven more spirits, more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. I just wonder, just wonder if this poor man had repeatedly gone through demon possessions. For a time, something seemed to work. Maybe a new medicine, a new therapy, a different exorcist. But every time he seemed to be on the road to healing, the demons returned, along with seven more. And now, the Bible says, he has a legion of demons. A Roman legion was 6,000 plus soldiers. This man has a lot of demons dwelling in him. If you remove something, you take something out of your life, and you don't replace it with the truth, you're in danger of falling back into something even greater that held you into slavery. Proverbs 5, verses 22 and 23 says, The iniquities, the sins of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast by the cords of his sin. He dies for his lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. You may have heard this quote, uh, sin will take you farther than you ever thought you'd go. It will keep you longer than you ever intended to stay. And it will cost you more than you ever expected to pay. I don't think this man deliberately woke up one morning and said, you know, I, I think I'd like to be possessed by a legion of demons. I don't think he deliberately chose that. I don't think he said, I want to see how miserable I can be in a graveyard among the tombs, crying out day and night, yelling and screaming. I don't think that was his intention. But his life of misery probably started with some small steps in the wrong direction trying to play with sin. How close can I get to the edge without falling off? Trying to play with sin, but never realizing that those cords of sin would entangle him and enslave him. We know of it as the death of a thousand cuts, those seemingly small decisions, which can draw us farther and farther into an evil life and open us up to all kinds of evil, even demon possession. But the story goes on. There's only one hope for this man. The hope has come over during the night and has landed on the shore. 
In verses 6 and 7, we read in chapter 5, And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you by God, do not torment me. Now, I don't know whether it was this man or the demons speaking through him when he made this statement. But what's clear to me is that these words that this man spoke are an admission that this man is dealing with none other than God himself. With the expression, son of the most high God, there's a recognition that Jesus is divine. He is the God man, fully God fully man. I want you to listen to this description of Jesus from the book of Philippians. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's our Jesus. That's the one who has landed on the shore to come over during the night to help this man. In verses 8 and 9, we read that Jesus begins to question and command the demons. Come out of the man, you unclean spirit, and what is your name? These powerful creatures are powerless against the Creator. They are powerless against Jesus. They must obey. They must answer. Legion, for we are many, is the answer given. As I said earlier, a legion of Roman soldiers was at least 6,000. And it seems to me that there were several thousands of demons entrapped, infested in this man. In verse 12, they beg him saying, send us into the pigs, let us enter them. So in 13, verse 13, Jesus gives them permission and the unclean spirits go out, enter the pigs, and it says the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. What a, what a conclusion you know, that happens here. Now, to the Jews, pigs are unclean animals. Jews always ate kosher, and they would never eat or touch a pig. They were unclean animals. They would have nothing to do with them. And there's a lot of speculation and thought, conjecture about what was happening here with these pigs. I've read people say, well, you know, that was unethical what Jesus did. Why would he destroy these animals? Uh, what would PETA say? People for the ethical treatment of animals. They would show up probably and begin to protest. What did you do here? Was it fair? What about the loss of income to the owners of this herd? 2,000, that's a lot of money lost. Did you know that pigs can swim? They're actually good swimmers, but they drowned. These are all interesting ideas, interesting things to talk about. Just not now. I want to look at the event, this event from this perspective. These unclean animals, this herd of pigs, was obviously so frightened by these exponentially more unclean spirits that in fear, trying to escape the sheer terror of these unclean, unclean spirits, they essentially jumped off a cliff and drowned in the sea. In today's culture, we, a lot of people think that people and animals have equal value and equal rights. Let me offer this teaching from Matthew chapter 10, verses 28 to 32, where Jesus says this, 
He says, don't be afraid of those who can kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What is the price of two sparrows, one copper coin? But not a single sparrow falls to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You are valuable than many sparrows. Jesus is telling us that even a small, insignificant bird's life is known to the Heavenly Father. He doesn't miss anything. He knows all about it. God is concerned with even the most minute details of his creation. Of course, everything has value. Everything has purpose. But a man's soul, a woman's soul, is of much more value to God than the life of a pig. How much a soul is worth to God. Jesus has traveled across the other side, to the other side. He's come through the waves and the wind. He's going to meet this pagan, this miserable, demon-possessed man. He is there not to bind him with a stronger chain, but to release him from his chains, to release him from his bondage. This man's soul, who everybody thought was hopeless, is of much more value to God than thousands of pigs. Does that excite you? Does that make you feel good that God thinks that of you? If it doesn't, take your pulse, because you're probably dead. I mean, God loves us so much that he's willing to do these things for us. Yes, he loves animals, but you are his creation, his special creation. Verse 14 through 17, the story begins to clue, conclude But it's not the hallmark ending you might expect. Everything turns out for the good, and everybody goes home happy, and uh, this and that. The caretakers of these animals that have drowned, they run back into the town, and they report all that's happened. A big crowd comes out to the site, and here they find the formerly demon-possessed man. It says, sitting there, clothed, and in his right mind, in verse 15. The explanation of what has happened is given by the herdsmen to those that have gathered. Imagine the scene. This formerly demon-possessed man sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, but nearby, floating in the sea, the bodies of 2,000 dead pigs. These people are filled with fear. You might think they would recognize Jesus and welcome him and his message. He has certainly shown his supernatural power. But instead, we read in verse 17, they began to beg Jesus to depart from the region. They wanted him to leave. Jesus has cost a great deal to the local economy. The loss is real. And their reaction shows that they're more concerned with lost income than with the healing of this demon-possessed man. To them, the security of a large herd of pigs and its income outweighs the value of a soul that has been redeemed from the enemy. This has a lot to say to us about the cost of following Jesus. And my willingness and your willingness to follow him no matter the cost. Now remember, Jesus has come over to the other side. He's presented himself to these people through supernatural work. There's no doubt that he is the son of the most high God. They don't deny the truth or the miracle of the message that Jesus brings, and yet they ask him to leave. Following Jesus might be too costly. Maybe you've heard this quote from Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott was a missionary in South America to the Indian tribes. And he said this, he made this statement. He said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Elliot was a missionary in South America. And in 1956, at 29 years of age, while trying to reach an unreached tribe with the gospel, 
He was speared to death, died as a martyr, he and four other men. That quote was found in his journals. <clears throat> what does it cost to follow Jesus? It costs everything. You want to be a follower of Jesus? It costs you everything. Jesus himself says in Luke 18.33, he says, So therefore, if any one of you does not renounce all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Following Jesus means that we relinquish control of our lives and we begin to follow him in all of our ways, no matter the cost. It's a daily decision that each of us has to make. Every day, we have to deliberately choose to follow Jesus and to give him control of our lives, our decisions, our direction. For most of us, it won't cost our lives, but it may. For most of us, it may not cost a herd of pigs, but it may. He gives us the grace to follow him. That's what I love. He calls us to follow him, then he gives us the strength to do it. Remember, he is always, he is always faithful to his promises and his blessings far exceed a herd of 2,000 swine. The people know they can't force him to leave, so they beg him to leave. You know, Jesus won't stay where he's not wanted. So in verse 18, it says he gets back into the boat to leave the area. It's sad. They've missed the message. But I have to ask myself and you, how often do I turn away from Jesus? Ask him to leave this or that area of my life where, that he wants me to relinqu relinquish control of. As Jesus is getting ready to leave, the healed man asks if he can come along. Jesus does not permit him, but instead tells him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. In verse 19, those that were there have rejected Jesus, but not everyone has heard the news. The healed demoniac is to go through the land and tell everyone all that Jesus has done for him. In obedience to Jesus, we read that he does proclaim in the Decapolis, those 10 cities, how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. So now we're going to bring our time together to a close. And this is a great true story from Scripture, but as we read and study God's Word, we need to take it and apply it to our lives. What is God telling me this morning? What's God telling you this morning? Because what's, what use is it to study God's word if we don't respond to it? We don't apply it to our lives. So this morning, that's what I'm asking you to do. And I don't know if you have altar calls, if you do calls in your pew, whatever you want. Whatever God's telling you to do, I want you to respond to God's word this morning. Don't respond to me. Respond to what God's telling you to do. So first, first question is, are you saved? can't assume that because you're in church, you belong to God, you really are saved. You might look at the demoniac and say, well, at least I'm not as bad off as that guy. Well, that's right. You're actually a lot worse. The Bible says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. We are spiritually dead to God. Each one of us is born physically alive, like the new baby we just saw, but spiritually dead. We need to respond to God's offer of eternal life. We're separated from God because of our sin. We choose to sin and we have a sin nature, and that cuts us off from the relationship that God desires with each one of us. We are helpless to cross over to get to Jesus. Nothing, not our good works, not our morality, not our intelligence, not our heritage, not our wealth, nothing can get us to the other side. Uh, lost my page here, sorry about that. There we go. The winds and the waves are too much for us. Think about the winds and the waves in chapter four. We're gonna sink, but God loves each one of you so much that he made a way for you to have spiritual life. 
Jesus is the way to God. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He is the bridge between God and man. He's the one who has crossed over himself to come and rescue us and has paid the price so that we might have eternal life. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works that no man can boast. God did this for us when he took his only son, Jesus, and he poured out all of his just punishment for our sin upon him. Jesus, who hung on that cross 2,000 years ago, only Jesus had the ability to satisfy God's justice, and only Jesus has the ability to defeat sin and death. He calls upon each one of us to place our trust, our complete trust, in what he has done for, for us on that cross. So have you come to that place in your life where you've done that, where you've surrendered yourself to Jesus and his work for you? You've completely put your trust in him. And it's not a matter of going to church, although that's good. It's not a matter of doing good things, although that's good. It's a matter of abandoning what you're trying to do and trusting what Jesus did for you. The Bible says that now is the day of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. And you can make a decision to trust Christ right now, right at this moment. You might say something like this, Dear Jesus, I admit that I've sinned against you in my words, thoughts, and actions. Right now I turn from these sins and trust you to save me from God's just punishment. I trust you only and alone for my salvation. Thank you for this new life. Amen. If you sincerely prayed for salvation, the Bible says that you are a new creation in Christ. And like a newborn baby, you need to grow and mature and develop. And we do that as we read and study God's word, as we pray and talk to God, as we gather together for worship and fellowship, and as you tell other people about the good news that's in your life. So my other question is maybe you're a follower of Jesus, but you've kind of gotten off track. You've let the things of the world crowd out your commitment to Christ. So now, right now, is the time to refocus yourself. It's the time to confess and repent of your sin, turn around and begin to following Jesus with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. He stands there on the shore of your life, waiting, ready. He wants you to follow him, no matter the cost. Are you willing to do that? And then finally, if you are a follower of Jesus, he commands you, each one of us, to tell others about the life that he offers. In Matthew 28, as you go into the world, in your going is where, what the, the words mean. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So it's salvation by grace through faith, discipleship, surrendering every day to God's will and his control, and witnessing Tell others what Jesus has done for you. And as we do that, God will bless and we'll be an encouragement to others as well. Let's just close our time with a, a prayer. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus and we thank you that you love us so much. And that love is demonstrated to us in a very clear way as we look at how you ministered in the life of this demon-possessed man. How you cast out those demons and gave him a new life, a new start. You gave him power and victory, not because of who he was, but because of who you are. And I pray that you would help us during this hour to fall in love with you more and more, 
that we would commit ourselves to you in all of our ways each and every day. Maybe there's something we need to surrender to Jesus. Maybe there's something we need to obey him in. I pray that you would help us to realize that when we do that, when we are obedient to you, the blessings follow, the blessings flow. I pray your blessing upon each one gathered here this morning, Father. You know each one's name. You know their story. You know the trials, the difficulties they come from. You are more than able to meet the need this morning. And may they cry out to you for the salvation that you offer. Bless Pastor Tim. Bless this new baby and his family. And we pray that you continue to use him as he leads and guides in this church. We praise you for our Savior, Jesus. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.